to start by addressing the question that Vaidehi asked, which is actually about uh, chapter one, and is about the fifth section of chapter one. And could you just read that aloud for us, that whole section you were asking about, instead of just the, the fragment you were doing before? Yes. Um, Therefore, for every troubling impression, practice saying at once, you are, you are an impression and not at all what you appear to be. Then examine it and test it by the standards which you hold. But first of all, and most of all, the standard, whether it is about the thing up to us or about the thing not up to us. And if it is about something that is not up to us, then be ready to say it's nothing to me. Okay, now restate the question you had about this. So, I kind of just don't understand the difference between being an impression and appearing to be something. There is no difference. That's what an impression is, is an appearance. But it says you are an impression and not at all. Well, he's, he's anthropomorphizing the impression. He says, when you have a troubling impression, like for example, I don't have, I, I don't have enough money, or um, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't prepare well enough for this or something. Uh, when you have a troubling impression, then take that impression and don't, don't just run with it. And certainly don't let it transform into an emotion or a pathological <coughs> state. But look at it and just say, that's just an impression. That's just how things appear to me. It's not, it's not anything more or less than just how something appears to me. And this already goes a long way towards dissipating its troublesomeness. But if you then follow through and apply the test of this dichotomy of determining, well, is this up to me or is it not up to me? Okay, well, suppose it's not up to me that uh, I don't have enough money, or that I'm a particularly ugly person, or whatever, then I'm not concerned with it at all. It doesn't affect, it's not me. It's something external to me. Whereas if, if, if it is up to me, like, how am I going to react to this? Am I going to never go into public, you know, because I, I, I consider myself so ugly or something? That's up to me. And that's what I should uh, focus on. But don't just dwell on the impression itself, and certainly don't fail to realize what it is, which is just a thought or a judgment in your mind that you're making. Um, and when we put that in the context of that whole extraordinary chapter, the introduction of this, and we get this dichotomy between things that are up to us and that are not up to us. Now, somebody some, some people have referred, uh, I think, erroneously, I think, to the so-called trichotomy. And that's how William Irvine puts it in his book. And I think Massimo Caslucci also signs up for that and says, well, Epictetus is wrong instead of a dichotomy. It, it, it ought to be a trichotomy. It's not just things that are up to us and things that are not up to us. There's also this third class of sort of mixed things that are partly up to us and partly not up to us. But that's a confusion and it's wrong. We can eliminate, or sorry, we can reduce the distinction to two things, what's up to us and what isn't up to us. And we will confuse ourselves if we think of it as being three things in this, this sort of um, confused, mixed third category of things that are partly up to us and, and partly not up to us. And the way to do this reduction is to analyze every uh, event or everything and then figure out what components in it are <coughs> up to you and what aren't up to you. So for example, if somebody um, spits in my face and, I, and, and, and there's a risk that I'm going to become angry about that and then I'm going to retaliate and do something stupid like, like beat them up or something, um, then we can analyze. You might think, well, that's a mixed thing. Some things are up to you and some things aren't up to you. That you were spit at is not up to you and the blah, blah, blah. But Epictetus wants us to, to say, OK, there are some things up to us and some things not up to us in this. So it is not up to me to have been spat at. 
it is not up to me to have blinked when that happens because that's an involuntary reaction that I have. But, and it is not up to me, perhaps, uh, I, I may then formulate a proposition like, this is a bad thing that this person has spited me unjustly and I want revenge. It's up to me now whether I assent to that or whether I don't assent to that. Thus, it is up to me whether I subscribe to a proposition that results in me becoming angry or not. So we shouldn't confuse this and say, well, that's one of those really complicated cases where it's kind of up to you, kind of isn't. The whole point of this is to get clear, because there's a categorical distinction between things up to you and things not up to you. And if you leave this confused, then you won't be able to focus on the things that are up to you, which are the only things that matter to you. And so that's exactly um, the kind of thing they're talking about when you have a troubling impression. So I have an impression that somebody somebody did this outrageous thing and spat at me, and that's, that's really horrible because it makes me look weak in front of my students or something like that. Um, well, that's just an impression. That's all it is. It's just something that appears so to me. It doesn't appear so to other people. Most other people don't care. Okay, and so then I can say, well, well so what am I going to do with that impression? Well, what I'm going to do is analyze it and say, that's not actually a bad thing. Because it's happened to a lot of good people that have had, you know, a pie thrown in their face. Okay, so if it's happened to Socrates, if Socrates had a pie thrown in his face, then it must not be a bad thing. Um, and so we need to apply that reasoning to every one of these troubling impressions or appearances that we have, and then we'll be in control of what happens to us, and specifically of whether, whether um, we do good or we do ill, or we suffer um, emotions or not. Okay, so any other, any thoughts about that or any other sections that struck you that you liked or didn't like Sam? I was struck by almost how opposite uh, the things that Epictetus described as being up to us or not up to us are compared to a lot of, you know, ideas would be out there today. Like a lot of people today would say that maybe you have to control your desires and that you don't follow them all the time, but you can't like get rid of them, or that emotions aren't something that you can get rid of and still say that that's a good thing. Or versions, people would say that you couldn't choose to not be afraid of something, but still to say that you should try to control that. And then things like possession, reputation, power, you know, your own body, people would see that as being kind of your responsibility as far as like, you know, working hard to have wealth or to, you know, build up your reputation or to take care of your body by doing certain things. So it's, uh, it's a lot different from how people think nowadays. Yeah, um, and, and there's this enormous confusion about these things. And it's funny you say how they think about it nowadays because it's also the way they thought about it those days and nothing's changed. Um, because humans haven't changed very much. I mean, since, since the time Epictetus is writing, not at all. And actually, for 50,000 years or so before that, nothing <coughs> has changed or any different. Okay, so that's, that's one thing. And then um, him, the specific things that he says are up to us versus are not up to us and that and that don't matter. And that he doesn't even he doesn't even want us to think of some of these things as being us. So if I have a lame leg, I'm supposed to think there's a lame leg there. I don't think I'm lame. I think there's some aspect of this body thing that I happen to have that has that problem. But that's not my problem, because it doesn't affect how what I assent to and what emotions or feelings I have, or uh, or don't have, and so all uh, all of these things that people think you should be most concerned with and are constantly encouraging you to be most concerned with are basically the things you don't actually have any control over, and even if you did, wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't be goods. 
And then the last things that people encourage you to do, you know, for example, philosophy, last thing you want to do is waste your life doing philosophy, actually gives you access to the, to the things that you do have control over and that are possible for you. So he's, he, he, um, you know, he's, he's sort of midpoint of ancient philosophy, but reminding, reminding people of that, um, of that fact, and as you, as you say, things remain exactly as they were then. Um, yes? So um, in chapter three, he says, he talks about the mud, so he says, um, should you be fond of a mud, and then say, I'm fond of a mud, because then when it breaks, it will be disturbed. And then he brings up an example of a child or wife, so he says, should you kiss your child or wife, and then say, yes. I'm kissing a human being, because then when she dies, you won't be disturbed. Right. So I was wondering, like, exactly what he means by this, because in, at least in my opinion, I would say that it's, like, almost humanly impossible to, like, both value someone and then just not be complete, not be disturbed at all if they were to die. So, like, for example, I would agree that, you know, you shouldn't be, like, permanently distraught necessarily, mm -hmm. but to say, like, oh, you won't even be, like, disturbed, you won't even be moved by, like, even a little bit, I feel like that would, it's a little bit extreme. Right, and Daniel, you mentioned this one is seeming odd to you before class too, right? And also, uh, I don't want to take away from your point, but well, no, no, and, and make sure you're talking about the same yeah, text yeah, before I, we move on to another one. Um, well, I mean, I was going to talk about how Seneca talks about the same thing. Okay, go ahead. Um, Seneca seems to bring up a point that may like contradict this. He he says that like if you're not disturbed at all. You're like, he compares that to like an animal. Like an animal has like this very strong desire to protect the child, but as soon as the child dies, they just don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so Seneca seems to say that if, if you don't have a little bit of grief, you're acting like an animal. Mm -hmm. That seems to contradict this point. Well, um, okay. Uh, and this also relates to a part of Sam's comment that I didn't address, the very first thing he said, that now we might talk about controlling emotions or limiting emotions and having moderate emotions, but we don't really talk about getting rid of emotions and stopping having emotions and an ideal, and we, didn't, and we don't talk about apathy as being an ideal anymore. Um, and uh, this, and, and what I hear everybody here saying is that, well, I can see you saying, moderate, that you should, have, you should be moderately disturbed. I mean, if my favorite mug here had been stolen by somebody since I left it over there, then, you know, I'd be really, I'd, I'd be, you know, slightly upset about that, but I shouldn't get too, you know, fly off the handle about it. And if my, um, if, if my sister dies, um, I should, I should feel kind of bad about that. Um, not, perhaps too bad, you know, we want to be philosophers here and not feel too bad about it, but, uh, but I, should, I should feel at least a little bit bad. And so that's a paradigm called moderation of emotions. And that's basically Aristotle's take on emotions, that there's a right amount of grief to feel, and there's a right amount of anger to feel, and there's a right amount of desire for wealth and for, uh, uh, glory and things like that. There's a right amount to feel, and you shouldn't have too much of it, but you also shouldn't have too little of it. Either one is a problem. It's an extreme. It's an excess or a deficiency, whereas you should hit a kind of mean state where you're exactly as angry as you should be. So if I see somebody doing an injustice, I ought to be angry with that, and there's something wrong with me if I'm not angry with it. So goes Aristotle's argument, and everybody's nodding their heads and going along with this, and this is, this is, of course, the common sense view that we should moderate emotions, and that that is perhaps a reasonable thing to do, a hard thing to do, but it's a reasonable thing to do, whereas it doesn't seem reasonable to eliminate uh, emotions and to completely extirpate them. Um, so... Now, that's just a statement. That's just a claim that we can't do it. And the Stoics are making exactly the opposite claim, that we can do it, that that, that is in our power to do. 
So simply stating, I don't think that a human could do that, is worthless against a, a, a statement that says, I think they can do it. Further argumentation or consideration of what's going on needs to take place. And he says, just as I can um, realize that uh, upon this mug being destroyed or lost, OK, well, I lost a mug. They can, they can, be, uh, they can be replaced. It's not that valuable anyway. Um, so with respect to a human being, I can say, well, it was, I, I didn't think that she was an angel or that she was a god or that she was immortal and would live forever and that I would live forever. I knew it was a human being. Human beings die all the time. We're all dying all the time, and they die every day, and lots of them have died in the past, and lots of them will die in the future, and that's what happens to human beings. And so that can't actually be a bad thing. That's just a feature of reality. So there's really actually something wrong by people who get upset with the, it's like people that get upset with taxes and think they want to set up their own country with guns within Texas and so forth so that they don't have to pay taxes. It doesn't work that way. Everybody pays taxes, just like everybody dies. Get over it, it's going to happen. To become upset about it is actually the bizarre uh, position. And it is possible to not be upset about it. And we have moral exemplars of people who aren't uh, upset about it. And being upset about it is itself a state that's based on a judgment, a value judgment about the things that is false, according to our analysis. So you've got to, you'd have to actually show that it's a bad thing that people die uh, in order to convince me that it would be true to think that it's bad that it's happened in that case, and thus that the attendant emotional state that follows from making that kind of judgment is an appropriate one to have. So it's no argument against the position to say, I, I, I just don't think people can do that. I get really upset when I hear people have died. <coughs> totally worthless against an argument that says, the reason you're getting upset is because you don't understand the value of things, and you're not taking into consideration the nature of reality and what things are really like. And so you could you could just remain in that state and say, I just don't think it can get it, it, it can get any better, and I just have to let grief pass once I stop thinking about it, right? I mean, how how long is is this grief supposed to last, Seneca? Exactly how long does it make sense to be upset about it. it, does, it if it's not actually something bad, and if becoming upset and distressed about it is a result of thinking that it is something bad, then no amount of that is justified. Any reduction in it would be good, and any amount of it being experienced is the unseemly thing that we should, we should reject and condemn and say that that's inhuman. People are just acting like animals that don't have control over what they're thinking about and what emotional states they have. If they just go along with how they feel, that's what animals do. That's not what humans do. Humans reason about how they react uh, to things. Um, but also, Chapter 15, he says that it's okay to, um, it's someone if they've lost, if they're leaving, um, but like as you said, it says it's, it's about his judgment over what has happened. But he also says <clears throat> that don't have to be supporting with encouraging words mm -hmm. if you're okay to suggest it. Um, but also care not to take or also go on the inside. So I thought that yes. was interesting how he said he can like console someone else, but um, in the end, like he shouldn't feel anything. Yes, that's crucial. So by the way, the best time to teach somebody this stoic theory of emotion and how they shouldn't be feeling any grief is not right when their sister or their wife has died. You don't then say, hey, let me, let me tell you what Epictetus would say about this, okay? That's not appropriate. Um, that it's too late, right? That's when you should give the person encouraging words and yes, well, let's, let's get through this and maybe I'll come have some tea on Tuesday and I've got a book I want to love you and so forth, okay? So it's not um, this cold, heartless thing that 
any time you see somebody crying at a funeral or any time somebody's acting frustrated or something, then you sit down and, and or you call up Monty Johnson and have him come lecture you about uh, stoicism. The point is that you figure this out before. You, you figure it out as early as possible and you start living and getting used to that way of thinking things so that, because inevitably these will happen. Lots of people are gonna die uh, unless you die uh, beforehand. But whatever the eventuality is, you're gonna wanna take into consideration uh, these thoughts and start inculcating them as soon as um, as soon as possible, but not everybody can do that. Not everybody's been exposed to that, and so so those people need need more time. And um, we should feel bad for them. We shouldn't feel pity for them, but we should feel bad for them. We should help them. Uh, so so it's it's perfectly okay to you know put your arm around somebody who's um, suffering from some emotional state. But if you really want to help them then start to you know, get at what they're thinking about. What's really bothering them is what they're thinking about and what values they have. And so if you really care about them, right? Again, if you don't really care about them, then just say, oh, don't, don't, don't worry, you'll find somebody else, or, or you'll get better soon, I'm sure about it. If you don't really care how they feel about it, you're just trying to get out of an awkward situation. But if you really care how they feel about it, then figure out what is causing the pain. And on this theory, it's thoughts that are causing the pain, and specifically thoughts that have false value judgments. Okay, but then, the, then there's a problem with chapter 33 then, 16, he says it's dangerous to use profane language. So, if someone, so when some story occurs, if the time is right, it's golden one cursing. But if it's not the right time, sure you discuss this custom by going silent, displaying your discomfort and scowling. If we're to remain different to other people's opinions or actions, what we then should discuss? If, if we, if so you're, you're, you're in chapter 33, which is one of the longest chapters, and you're at the very end, right? Very end, yeah. Section 16. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and read it out. It's also dangerous to use profane language. So when some swearing occurs, if the time is right, scold the one cursing. But if it's not the right time, I'm sure you discuss it as cussing by going silent, displaying your discomfort, and scowling. Mm -hmm. So why way. is that? Now that's supposed to be some huge contradiction of what I was it, just talking it about. It seems counterintuitive to the earlier point we were talking about how you need to kind of distance yourself from things you can't the, control. The, oh, it, okay. It, 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 the, 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 the control. He's talking about somebody swearing or being obscene um, in speaking and giving a lecture or giving giving a comedy routine or something like that. He's not talking about somebody swearing because they just hit their thumb with a hammer or something like that. Right, but it, it's not under your control, so why would you be disgusted or discomforted by it? Um, <clears throat> well, disgust is sort of like blinking. Okay, it's not something I have control over. Somebody does something that, uh, and, and, and you feel disgust. Now, um, and it, it's sort of like embarrassment, i.e. the part of embarrassment where uh, your face turns red. You don't have any control over that part. Okay, but you have control over whether, for example, you stand up and denounce the person immediately that you feel disgusted at or that or, or whether you just sit there silently under control and and, um, and, and, and sort of scoff. I, th I think maybe scoffing is how I would put that, but scowling happens a lot too in these um, uh, situations. So I think I think we have to interpret that as being one of these one of these preliminary stages that's not under our control. There is a kind of there's a kind of reaction. Um, like if I eat bad food and I react to it, that's not into my control. You shouldn't say, oh, come on, be, be stronger about that. I mean, that part I can't deal with. If I say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't like food unless, it's, it, unless it has really um, nice sauce or unless it's served with really nice silverware, then you've got a problem and, and that person needs to be corrected. But if they're having a reaction, an involuntary physi physiological reaction, and disgust is 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 
he's, he, he's sort of presenting that like one of them. Um, I don't know what his problem with profane <coughs> language is. I love profane language and obscenity, so I disagree with him entirely on this. I think it's, I think it's funny, I think it's good, and I think people that, that denounce it and say there are certain words we can't use and that sort of thing is ridiculous. So I actually don't, I, I, I don't have a huge stake in defending that claim, but I think, I think that what he's doing is really trying to point out you can get really upset with somebody while you're sitting there listening to something they're saying that you might disagree with, um, but you can control how you how you <coughs> react and how you how you deal with that. Um, for example, you could bring a gun to campus and threaten people. This happened last week. Um, you know, that's that's not the kind of that that kind of reaction shouldn't happen. That's a bad thing. That's a bad way uh, to deal with that. You should sit silently, display your discomfort, and scowl uh, instead. Henry? Um, could it be read in the same way as the, the section that it was supposedly supposed to counter, just like how a, a Stoic is supposed to communicate with like the uninitiated, someone who isn't a Stoic, or even a Stoic yet? Yes, so, well, um, it, 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 it does seem that you mean, you mean that's essentially what all this section is about, dealing with non-philosophers? Well, both, both 16 and 34 and the, I forget which one we discussed earlier, um, the chapter, chapter... By the way, I, I do agree with what he says in section 11 of this. Don't go to people's lectures carelessly <laughs> or casually, but when you do, guard your decency and stay calm, and at the same time, don't be irritated. That's like genius. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, but so I, I, I think the situation there is annoyance felt at essentially academic talks and things like that, and 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 you should you should keep your cool and let the person speak. So this, I I, I think this reprehensible behavior of preventing people from speaking, preventing Nazis and so forth from speaking, and 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 punching them and, and depriving them of the ability to make their case is a really stupid thing to do. Um, that they should, be, they should be allowed to speak so that we can hear what they're saying and then counteract the claims and the arguments they're making. Um, so that's the kind of thing he's, he's, he's talking about, is really how to handle yourself when you're, you're in this kind of context. And by the way, this is, this is still something under a lot of dispute. So, you know, now in the philosophy department we have various hand signals and so forth we use about how you can intrude into a into a discussion or interrupt an argument or ask for a clarification and things like that. Uh, because it can get very touchy. By the way, there's a talk, there's a philosophy colloquium this Friday on Plato's theory of the soul from four to six PM in the seminar room of the philosophy department seventh floor, and you're all invited if anybody wants to come by and hear the talk from four to five, and or stay for the discussion from five to six. Okay, uh, who, who else had a hand up? Yes, and, I, and so have you, Hunter, and uh, Esther. Uh, actually, I missed you from way back, right? Uh, yeah, but... Okay, go, go ahead. Okay, and, so um, I was just wondering go down about this road. The, the, when you were talking about death, um, is it possible for a Stoic to not assent to the belief that death is bad, yet still grieve for the loss of um, that friendship? It, didn't we talk about someone who considered like friendship a virtue and being in, like living? Well, other Stoics, people? Stoics, right? Did, that's what I'm sure, saying. Yeah. I don't remember exactly who yes. we were talking about. So, is is that would a Stoic be in line with their beliefs if they did that? Because I think it's possible to grieve someone without actually believing their death is bad. Well, um, it, it, then, then what is, what do you mean by grief? Uh, a sense of loss over their... A bad, painful feeling. Yes. And so you should, you should have that bad, painful feeling in response to this event, this person dying. That, that, that could be appropriate in your view. Yes. Okay, and that... Um, so first thing they say is no, you shouldn't. You should have a tranquil life where you don't feel bad. Right. So do you and and so if 
uh, imagine the, the, the implications of what you're saying. Then, then the people that were most aware and most keyed into the suffering that people experience, you know, the people that are, that are really working with people that are suffering and dying and things like that, then they should experience massive grief and turmoil constantly, right? I mean, how would it be bearable to, 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 to be a nurse or something in that situation if they should feel grief at, at, seeing, at, at, at seeing death constantly and inevitably happening? Um, it, 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 that, that, that would mean, that would be to take the best people and say that they should feel the worst of all. And then I, bad I, people who don't, who, don't, who don't think of this stuff and don't care about this stuff, um, then they have the most enjoyable lives. Because they don't, they don't give any consideration to that. And this is with what assumption are you making? So I, I'm making the assumption that if, if it's true that we should feel uh, that, that there's some amount of grief that one should feel, okay, that it's appropriate to feel a certain amount of grief, then those people who are more keyed into situations where people are suffering and dying <laughs> will, will consequently have a much higher level of grief that's appropriate for them to feel. And it'll actually be, be, be un, absolutely unbearable for them. So you might be giving yourself permission to feel a little bit of grief because this friend of yours happened to die. Well, how much grief is appropriate for somebody who, who's um, working at a hospice and like people are dying every day that they're, that's, that's that they're what working I'm saying, with? Like, grieving the loss of a relationship. If you're a nurse, many nurses feel grief over the loss of patients, but these are not people that they're necessarily close to, and so the relationship they're grieving, grieving is necessarily smaller. So their grief is smaller, hypothetically. Uh, well, no, no, no. They're, they're forming relationships with all these people before they die, and so forth. They're becoming friends with these people before they die. And, and, and should the mother that has 10 children feel 10 times as much grief as each of her children dies than, than just one mother that has one child? Now we're leaving in the hands of fortune how much grief and, and misery we feel. Like we're letting things that aren't, aren't up to us, like how many close friends we have. You only have one close friend, so you don't feel that much grief except when she dies, but you may actually die before her. But I have a hundred close friends, and a lot of them are suffering from different terminal illnesses and so forth. And, and, and they tell me about it and I learn about it. So I should, I should be suffering like 50 or 100 times as much grief as you, right? Well, I, actually the idea is let's not leave it up to external chance how much grief and how upset we feel, right? Okay. Since, since it's in our control to feel it or not. And, and it's not an appropriate thing. Yes, we can memorialize our friends. Yes, we can wish that our, that our, we, 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 we can think it would be nice if our friend was here having a cup of coffee with us or discussing philosophy with us or whatever. But don't think it's bad. Don't, don't, just, just don't think that it's a bad thing that they <coughs> don't. Right, that, that, was, that was my point. Is it appropriate to feel that feeling? Oh, I kind of wish they were here. Yes. Yes, that is that. That seems like a eupatheia to me. <coughs> like a you. Like oh well, yeah. Wouldn't this be a great situation for you know John Rist to be able to be here and participate with us? It's like somebody who's not here that's alive. Isn't that an right, unfortunate right. that they aren't? So and we should have that kind of feeling about it, right? That would that be an appropriate be, stoic response. It'd be so awesome yeah. if Brad Inwood, if William Stevens was here right now and we could be talking to him about it. But let's not. Let's not lament that old father is dead and can't be here and so forth, and then all these other translators of Epictetus that, that came before him, because then we're leaving how much grief and how upset we are into the hands of things totally outside of our control. Okay. Okay, now, um, yes. So, similarly about the friendship and the relationship, uh, in chapter 13, Epictetus says that if you appear to anybody to be someone important, you trust yourself. It's like you, the, the Stoics don't want to like make like strong relationships with, with the friend and each other. They said if you like make, like if you have like few relationships and few friends, you will be more like, like undeserving. It's 
Um, well, I don't, I don't see that either in what you've said here or in anything else we've read, although I think the point could theoretically be made. But Stoics would say, no, no school values friendship more than we do, and we consider friendship a virtue and so forth. So, uh, and, and, but but here, this does not say that what, what this says is that um, if you appear to anybody to be something important, distrust yourself. Okay? So that is not the same as saying don't make friends with people. Okay, that's, that's, that's if somebody says, oh, wow, you're a professor at, at a university, you know? That's, that's really important. Then I should, I should think, okay, you know, some, something's, something's wrong. You know, as I give more talks, the introduction to these grow longer and more profusive with praise about my publications and so forth. My, the appropriate reaction to have to that is go, okay, this is becoming increasingly detached from reality as well. Okay, uh, that's the appropriate response to have to that. Not to think, wow, maybe I, maybe I really am great. Maybe I'm really a philosopher and, and, and people really look up to me and want to know about this stuff from me. In, instead, you should doubt yourself in that situation. So that passage doesn't actually talk about friendship. Okay, Hunter. Okay, so uh, in chapter seven, uh, he talks about uh, like there's this captain that you should follow, I guess, like an end all be all, and in relation to like other things that you make, yes. like, like a family or like vegetables or something like that. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, what he is comparing the captain with, because it, I, I was thinking maybe like death or reason, but like, uh, so so death would work because it says like, uh, should he call him with discard of all food uh, so that you are not tied up and thrown back on board like the sheep? So like that could be like I don't know. Uh, the, 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 the ship of death, where is the captain? My, of death. my interpretation of this is that um, it, 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 the captain of the ship is God. It's God. Uh, and, and, the, and the ship leaving is death. Oh. Okay? And that, um, because, and, and, and so just as you go as, uh, ashore to get fresh water, you might also find some other things that you can take, but it would be it would be a problem to dilly-dally and be, and be so concerned about those that you miss the call back to the ship when it's the appropriate time. Um, and so you ought to think of these other things in your life as being like them. And, and then when it says, um, if you're given a spouse and a child instead of shellfish and vegetable, there's no trouble with that. That's the strange part that Makes us, makes us wonder what exactly is he getting at. He's not saying they should just be discarded like shellfish and vegetables and run for the ship. He's saying you should be just as willing to leave them and uh, to die and not be overly concerned about how they are reacting to your death or things like that. So then in that case, uh, when he says at the end, if you're old, then don't stray far from the ship so that when you hear the call to return, you aren't left behind. That's pretty much like don't stay longer than you're supposed to. Yes. Like your time of death. Yeah, I think, I, I think so. Okay.